Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic matter is dry skin. And with the change in weather about ready to occur as summer fades away and we enter into the fall and winter months, I thought I'd address this issue on dry skin. As far as the causes, what we can do to do some reversal and prevention as well too. When we look at the causes, obviously number one, and I hear this continually when people complain about dry skin to me, is it has a lot to do with your hydration. Now, hydration has to do with adequate amounts of water, so you need to be doing your eight glasses of water per day in addition to your food, and oftentimes the lack of good fats in the diet. Now remember those good fats help keep the, the skin um, moist and help hold you retain water. Now we can also address this issue from a standpoint of vitamin B, C, and mineral deficiencies as well as a poor diet. When we have a lot of caffeine in the diet, soda, uh, a lot of sugar, the skin will tend to dry out faster because your body will tend to either hold on or excrete water. You have a hard time balancing the water systems. So eating a diet that is nutritionally dense, and we'll talk about it a little further on here, is really helpful for dry skin. Medications such as diuretics and believe it or not antihistamines that dry you up also dry the skin because they wash your electrolytes and water out of the body. And they make things kind of a dry situation. There are other medications that can also cause uh, dry skin as well too and there's an umpteen hundred different kinds that affect fatty acid balance and water balance as well. Um, Thyroid, estrogen, progesterone imbalances. We'll hear this continually with people who have thyroid problems is they'll also have dry skin. So having the proper type of thyroid medication or thyroid medication balance between T3 and T4 is really important. Progesterone and estrogen deficiencies as women approach perimenopausal and menopausal, sometimes they'll find that they're gonna be estrogen and progesterone deficient and that can lend, I'll have women come in to me and say, I'm getting old, my skin is shriveling. And because the moisture ability, these hormones or these particular hormones definitely help with holding um, uh, water into the system and keeping you looking young and plump in your skin. Um, diabetes, smoking also affects. Now remember with diabetes, you tend to pee more often. As the sugars rise, you pee more. And so diabetes, and then smoking depletes your vitamin C levels, so if you don't have adequate amounts of C, you can't hold moisture in the skin. For every cigarette that you smoke, you lose 25 to 50 milligrams of C on an average. So if you're smoking a pack a day, we're talking 500 to 1,000 milligrams of C ability lost in the skin. And if you're not supplementing properly, your skin not only will age quickly, but you will not be able to hydrate. Of course, as we enter the drier months and the drier climate time, we notice as well, too, that our skin tends to dry out. And because obviously when the humidity is a little bit drier, we're a little bit drier. So when your hair dries in two minutes versus 10 minutes, you kind of know that your skin's going to dry that, uh, that way as well. Harsh cleansing agents, uh, certain types of soaps, soaps, sodium lauryl sulfate, and moisturizers that have a lot of alcohol in them can dry the skin as well, too got to watch for the chemicals and the cleaner of the chemicals and the fewer ingredients always the better when you're talking about skincare products. Fair skin is more likely to dry than darker skin. Fair skin people tend to have a little bit drier skin as a general overall. Then we also need to look to the genetics. Some families are just known to have dry skin, you know, due to thyroid or hormone imbalances or blood sugar issues. And then last but not least, the sun damage. Remember the sun damages the body's, the collagen matrix, and remember that collagen is necessary for you to hold on to moisture in the skin. So obviously if you have the sun damage, doing your best to try and hydrate the skin through the things I'm gonna suggest would be most helpful. Now when we're talking about diet, I already uh, mentioned already that the sugar, soft drinks, potato chips, junk foods, those tend to dry you out. They're very rich in um, very simple sugars and that will make you pee more, raise the blood sugar, and dry the skin out in addition to being nutritionally deficient. 
Alcohol and caffeine, obviously, you know, when we have more alcohol and caffeine, we're going to lose more water and you're going to dehydrate quicker. They actually have these machines, um, I know I've seen them at health food trade shows, where literally they can examine how hydrated your skin is. And those people who do a lot of alcohol or caffeine will tend to have much drier skin as a general rule. Avoid fried foods, animal fats, or heat-treated vegetable um, oils. Those types of fats do not allow the skin to hydrate, and they actually clog the pores, not allowing the good fats to come through and lay that nice little layer of fat on the skin, on the outside of the skin, to keep you nice and moist. Um, when we talk about diet, um, we have, and, I, and you can get a copy at, our, at, our, at the Vitamin Herb stores, but on YouTube you can also check out the metabolic diet. Now the metabolic diet um, infers a lot of good, adequate amounts of protein, adequate amounts of good fats, and a lot of fruits and vegetables in the diet. These are all necessary for healthy skin tissue so that you can hold on to moisture in the skin so it doesn't look old and crinkly. Um, for Part of this involves two to three servings of fruit, four to six servings of vegetables. All of these are very nutrient-dense foods and have a lot of certain types of chemical bioflavonoids, uh, prosanthinins, a lot of different chemicals that help the skin tissue repair and hold on to moisture. And I know a lot of people look to me and say, oh my God, how do I get four servings of vegetables? You can do smoothies or just make sure at lunch you get two servings of veggies and dinner you get two servings of veggies. It's not that hard to do because if you have a nice big salad and you're throwing on carrots and beets and all, all the good things, and if your snacks are like celery with peanut butter or at lunch you're having some carrot sticks with your ranch dressing, you've already knocked off four servings of your fruits and vegetables without very little thought or effort. Eat a minimum of a third a cup of nuts, avocados, anything that adds up to a third of those good fat, a third a cup of those good fats per day. Those good fats go into the body, they reduce inflammation, and they come out through your pores as nice thin oils, which will coat your skin, don't clog your pores, and moisturize the skin. Avocado is just one of the absolute best fruits uh, for the skin um, because it's so dense and good essential fatty acids, both topical application as well as internally eaten. Now you have to have adequate amounts of protein. And I see particularly with a lot of my seniors, just the lack of ingestion of protein. And that means three meals of protein a day and a couple snacks in between. So you really do have to make an effort to think about the amount of protein you're getting in. That bowl of cereal in the morning is not going to cut it as far as your protein or getting you up to the protein you need to have adequate skin repair so that you can hold on to water. Um, green tea or white tea, those types of teas, and looking for primarily the decaffeinated forms. However, green tea is so low in caffeine, the catagens that are in green tea neutralize the effects of the caffeine on the body. But those antioxidant types of teas, and I'm not talking about the good old Lipton types of teas, I'm talking about the teas that are really rich in antioxidants like the green or white tea, are very good for skin health. They actually help flush out some of the toxins out of the body as well too. All right, supplements. Now, oftentimes some of the supplements you see on here are repeats for a lot of other issues that we have that go on or lectures that I've given over the last five and a half years. Number one is always a good multivitamin high in Bs. And Bs and Cs work together to help the skin tissue repair and the collagen matrix in the skin repair. So please don't go to a warehouse or a grocery store to get your vitamin. Most of those are imported from China. The FDA has in no circumstance uh, an ability to regulate things coming out of China and chances are good you're going to get a vitamin that has not what it says in it, number one, and full of toxic chemicals. Now those toxic chemicals also age the skin tremendously and don't allow the skin tissue to repair or hold on to good natural um, fats as well as moisture. Um, so the B's and C's, now if you do not have adequate amounts of C, like in the case of cigarette smoking, the skin cannot hold on to moisture, nor in addition, it won't support the capillaries. Now see, 
The C and Bs are necessary to strengthen the capillaries and the veins and arteries to carry water and nutrients to the skin. And obviously people who, who um, bruise real easy or um, have spider veins or varicose veins very often are extremely vitamin C deficient. Uh, according to the National Institute of Health, a good segment of our population is a borderline scurvy because it's just not rich in our foods any longer. So supplementation is required to get adequate amounts of C. No longer can you get it from your diet. You cannot. I, I see more breakdown in all different ailments because the C is lacking. Vitamin A. Now you'd like to have a multi that has at least 10,000 IUs of vitamin A. And um, you know you don't want anything in excess of 25,000 IUs of vitamin A over a lengthy period of time. But adequate amounts of A help strengthen skin tissue, especially in fair-skinned women who oftentimes don't uptake or take the beta carotene and convert it into A in the, in the body. So oftentimes, particularly fair-skinned women, require a little additional amounts of vitamin A. Vitamin E, very strong antioxidants, a mix to cough for all form is necessary to prevent um, oxidation and, and aid and abed the skin's ability to hold moisture. Fish or flax oil. Um, if you're not good at eating your nuts, or like me, you're allergic to nuts and <laughs> most nuts and avocados, fish or flax oil can be a nice um, alternative in order to get the body full of those good fats to help you hold on to moisture. Remember, once again, the fats help your skin hold on to moisture and we know, for example, like seals or animals uh, that are in the marine life always have a good amount of those fatty acids to help them hold moisture in the skin. Um, borage oil in combination with the flax, reduction of inflammation in the skin as well, thereby helping to hold on to the moisture. Now I know most people go minerals helping you hold on to the moisture in the skin, now see, minerals, and not just calcium magnesium, but other minerals, are necessary as buffering alkaline agents in the body. Now when the body is acidic, and you've got a lot of sugar, white flour, pasta, starches, things like that going, your body's going to pull minerals out of the bones in order to neutralize the pH, and you're going to pee a lot, you're going to lose a lot of the water. These buffering agents help neutralize the pH in the body, bring you more to an alkali form, and therefore you're gonna be able to hold on to water a lot better as well too. Now remember, it takes, um, you'll lose a lot of electrolytes when you do a lot of diuretics or coffee or that uh, alcohol. It takes a minimum of 4,700 milligrams of potassium per day. And I'll tell you that 400 milligram banana ain't gonna cut it. So look online and look for potassium rich foods as well. Hard to get adequate amounts of magnesium rich foods anymore because of commercial farming. But looking to a calcium citrate, magnesium citrate in a, uh, a supplement form is very helpful. Now some new studies on a phenomenal uh, anti-aging supplement that helps support the vascular system, actually works on blood pressure and other things. But 60 to 120 milligrams of pycnogenol a day increased collagen in dry, scare, uh, dry skinned women by 40%. I don't think there's any uh, supplement or um, I should say any um, commercial that could promote this type of collagen uh, and skin elasticity and moisturization of those with dry skin than pycnogenol. So if you combine it with everything I have listed on here along with the dietary recommendations, you are gonna have absolutely great skin from an internal standpoint. Now, I want to take some time to talk about topical skin care. You know, when you look at, uh, and you go into your local drugstore and you look at all the wonderful things they promote on TV, and they look like a chemical lab when you look at the moisturizers. And I would say, even myself, with my background, my science background, some of the chemicals I have to look up online because, <laughs> because they have different names for multiple things. But when you're talking about looking at a moisturizer, basic is always better. And you, you know, we look to cultures like India or some of the Asian cultures that use good fats as moisturizers on, uh, topically on the skin. For example, when you wash with like a coconut olive or almond oil based soap, you know, Dr. Bronner's soaps, there's other types of soaps that are coconut, olive or almond oil based, 
or I know Dr. Oz is promoting the black soap, which is a shea butter, coconut oil type of soap. You're not going to dry and pull those good oils out of the skin. Now, you don't want to sit there. I know a lot of people like to feel that nice, clean feeling. These will leave you with a nice, clean feeling, but won't pull out the good fats out of the skin tissue that help maintain that suppleness and keep the skin from drying out. Now, topical application, I can't tell you the number of customers who have used all the fancy stuff, $80 bottles of moisturizers, including some of my staff people, that come in and I've recommended either the coconut butter, shea butter, olive oil, or almond oil, that don't come in seriously and say, oh my gosh, my skin is so much better. Um, I use a, a shea butter or, um, or a little bit of grapeseed oil, because I'm allergic to coconut and olive oil, but these types of oils, and when you combine it with aloe vera, if you don't have a sensitivity towards aloe, just hold moisture on the skin so nice and help the skin repair. These are nutrient-dense foods. These are things you can eat on the inside, but also exteriorly applied, really hold moisture in the skin, and they're, they're viscous, they don't clog the pores, and you're going to feel great when you use these type of moisturizers and knowing that you're not putting a science lab on your face. That's a tremendous problem I'm seeing nowadays. When we look at all these moisturizers, I see tons of alcohol in them, which dry out the skin, and I see tons of parabens and methoparabens and other things that literally, in order to get the moisturizers to deliver into the skin, they're putting these chemicals that actually tear away at the collagen in order to give you the appearance that you actually have moist skin. So whenever you can, basic types of things. There is actually the pycnogenol that I mentioned up here. There's pycnogenol creams and gels uh, in combination with like a nice vitamin E oil that can be very much used in conjunction with these good oils that can help moisturize the skin. Once again, they don't look like a chemistry lab where you have to look everything up. Now something that we sometimes don't think about is to, do, to get our skin, we need to clean it properly. And I gotta tell you, a nice little sauna, whether you sit in a sauna uh, room or uh, like in our case, uh, my husband and I have like an infrared sauna that we sit into and we sweat. Sweating or a weekly sauna or putting your, your face over some steam to get your face to sweat out all the toxins and everything in it and to get stuff moving out of the skin, Boy, your skin will just be nice and soft and supple if you can do that a couple times a week just to clean out the pores. Gently exfoliate the skin. You can get gentle exfoliators that clean off that dead, dry skin and stimulate the skin, new skin tissue uh, underneath. And the newer the skin tissue, the better able it is able to hold moisture. Last but not least, and we see this in, oftentimes in the wintertime, a lot of people will complain about dryness, not just in the skin, but all over the whole body. You know, we've got the air conditioners or the heaters, particularly the heaters in our area working continually, and they dry out the air. And so as you're going out in the wind, you dry out the skin. So oftentimes a humidifier in the bedroom at night, you can turn that on and it will help moisturize the air for both your breathing and your skin as well. To iterate again, the good diet, high in antioxidants, a lot of good water, lots of good fats in the diet, good fats topically applied, looking at some of the nutrients that help feed the skin. All this combination, remember your skin, when you look at it, it shows your overall health. And so when you can pull back your sleeve and say, hey, my skin looks as good as a 20-year-old, as far as my health of my skin, I'll tell you, that's everything to how you look and a diagnostics of how healthy you are as well. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And I'm just going to show a quick couple of yoga moves that can help with a little bit of exhaustion. And you can do this in your office. And what this does is it stimulates the nervous system in the spine. And they're very simple. You just get into like a tabletop position where everything's nice and flat. You're going to arch your back. And this is called cat. 
and you're going to hold it for three to five breaths and then you're going to switch down into what we call cow which is a swayed back cow position you got your breath your back slightly arched your chin a little bit up three breaths and you'll do like three sets of that and what that's going to do is it's going to get your spine uh, moving and the fluid in your spine moving and wake your nervous system up next we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show thank you Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? And thank you for that intro. Well, today we're going to talk life expectancy. Life expectancy primarily in the United States. Well, the UN uh, did a little mortality rating of the United States just recently, and it seemed to not make it in our news by some unusual reason. Well, this is what the stats came down to, primarily. And if you're white in the United States, you have some issues. Minorities, black and Latino, has slight increase in life expectancy regardless of education. Females, for whatever reason, got hit really hard. Uneducated, I should say, females did not graduate high school on the lower income level of the spectrum, lost five years in life expectancy. They went from 78 and a half years in 1990 to 73 and a half years in 2008. White males who did not have a high school education even fared worse. They went, I should say not fared worse, but life expectancy is even less. From 70 and a half years in 1990 to 67 and a half years in 2008. Kind of a little interesting trend, the more medically we get treated, the lower life expectancy seems to go down. Now keep in mind, this is not healthy years, this is total life expectancy. I'd be really curious to see how many healthy years are there. Now think about it for a white male that didn't graduate high school. You'll be paying into the Social Security system your entire life, and by the time you're about to collect Social Security, your life expectancy is over. So, in the United States, we are literally, literally working our people to death. What the heck is going on? We should be making an increase in life expectancy, not dropping this dramatically in this short a period of time. Now let's look at it as far as like overall for females. All right, 1985, females in the United States ranked 14th in the world for life expectancy. All right, now year 2008, out of all the developed countries, how many developed countries do we have in this study? 41. Where did women in the United States, white women, regardless of education level, fall into this category? 41st. White women in this, in this country, the United States of America, now rank last of all developed nations for life expectancy. We dropped from 15th in 1985 down to 41st by the year 2008. We are being treated more often, more diagnostic, more drugs, more medicine, you named it all the way down the line, yet we continue to plummet. That is not what we call advancement. And that's why it did not make the news. Because to think about it, you no longer can bury your head in the sand. You have to start asking questions, what's going on? Because now it's affecting you personally and how you live your life and how long you live your life overall. All right. Now we go to genetically modified corn. The French recently did a study a few days ago about September 18th, sorry, take that back, September 21st, they released it. And what it came down to this genetically modified corn produced by a company called Monsanto. It's called NK603. It's okay with us in the United States. It's been consumed for a while. But on the animal studies, which, dedicated, which determined it being safe, you only have to feed animals that corn for three months, and the animal we tend to feed is mice. Well, if you feed mice this corn for three months, you'll find out they're pretty healthy. Three months for a mouse is about adolescence. But if you carry out these trials to four months, what you'll discover is tumors begin to form. Liver failure, kidney failure, mammary tumors. 
You carry out the study to two years, whatever mice are left, which have about a 50% uh, mortality rate in the male mice, and 70% mortality rate in the female mice, about 80% of those remaining will have tumors. And of those, they'll have up to three separate tumors. Why is this? It's not an argument against genetic modification. It's an argument against inserting genes into a new form of wheat, which we've been doing here, called gene silencing. What genes does it silence? Well, in humans, it silences the gene responsible for converting carbohydrates to glucose. It's the same gene that they put in the wheat. The problem is it's almost identical to the human gene, therefore our bodies can't determine the difference. Now also, again, the mice can't determine the difference either. So, what they did is they came back with an argument. Well, obviously, in the United States, they said that basically, let's go to this one. Well, outside of this, let's back up a little bit more too. Now France is issuing probes into all the genetically modified foods and demanding independent studies. Not studies basically produced by Monsanto themselves and then submitted to basically the EU or the United States for approval. So now there's a desperate demand and cry for independent studies. These studies, I honestly, if you look them up yourself, look at the French studies in NK603 in regards to mice, you'll be quite horrified at what happened to these mice being fed this corn, the same corn that you may be consuming. All right, this is my favorite counter argument that the genetic modified proponents came in favor of. This was produced by Mark Tester. Now you have to take all arguments into consideration, so let's let them defend it. Well, they defended it basically as being this. Mark Tester was a research professor at the Australian Center for Plant Functional Genomics at University of Adelaide, said, quote, well, obviously it can't be bad if its effects are as big as purported and if the, and if the work really is relevant to humans, why aren't the North Americans dropping like flies? Says genetic, genetically modified food has been in the food chain for over a decade and longevity continues to increase inexorably. All right, back to what was the first one we did? You've life expectancy in the United States of women dropped from, I should say, sorry, 14th place in 1985 to 41st in the year 2008, I think Mark Tester needs to reevaluate his research because basically something's really, really wrong. Is genetically modified food responsible for it? We don't know. But right now, there has to be a clear and present cause to basically take these studies away from these companies and start running independent trials for the health of not just yourself, but everybody. Well, thank you. My time is up. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate it. Once again, do your research. Thank you for joining our show. Have a good night.